Hello, this is the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Thank you so much for tuning into this video in which I'll go through everything you need to know for your final exam. So I'll cover all of these topics listed on your screen. So let's get started with grouped frequency tables from statistics. So sometimes what we will have is a large range of data. So this data displayed in this table goes from 0 to 100. I don't want to write out a full-on frequency table. I don't want to say 0, how many scores? 1, how many scores? 2, how many times that score occurred? All the way down to 100. That would take forever. So sometimes it's just so much easier to group the data. So what I've done here is I've grouped the data in groups of 25. So read this as x is between, the score is between 0 and 25. So note 25 is not included in this group because of the less than symbol. 25 is included in this group. So this is all the scores from 0 up to but not including 25. This is all the scores from 25 up to but not including 50 and so on. So I've got four groups and this frequency column just tells me how many in each group. So there are 12 in this group, 10 in this group and so on. So when we have a grouped frequency table, as I said, it's very convenient for displaying the data, but the drawback of it is that we don't know the individual scores. But what we can do is we can use a trick to estimate the mean and median of this data. So you know that the mean of the data is the sum of all the scores divided by how many there are. Well, how am I going to add up all the scores if I don't actually know them? What I'm going to do is I'm going to add another column to my table. So what we're going to do is find the midpoint of each group. So the midpoint of 0 and 25, just halfway between 0 and 25, is just 12.5. And then the halfway point between 25 and 50 is 37.5. If you don't know off the top of your head what it is, add up the two endpoints and divide by two. So if you don't know what's halfway between 50 and 75, 50 plus 75 divided by two. So why am I calculating the midpoint? What we're going to do is we're actually sort of going to pretend that each score is equal to the midpoint. We're going to pretend that all 12 of these scores are equal to the midpoint 12.5 because, like, on average, they would be, you know, close to 12.5. And then we're going to pretend all these 10 scores are equal to 37.5 because, on average, the scores in this group would be equal to 37.5. So essentially what I'm saying is we're pretending there are 12 scores that are 12.5, 10 scores, 37.5, and so on. So I need another column in which I multiply these two scores together. So I go 12 by 12.5, I get 150. And then I go 10 times 37.5, which gives me 375, and so on. So the reason I'm multiplying this is purely for convenience. If we've got 12 scores that are 12.5 and we want to find the mean, we have to add them up. But I don't want to go 12.5 plus 12.5 plus 12.5 12 times. That takes too long. This is just a quick way to add them up. Instead of going 37.5 added to itself 10 times, I can just times them together. Now, if I add up all of these scores, so this symbol here means sum of, the sum of the FM column, all of these numbers added together, I get 1225. That is the sum of all the scores of the data. If I add up this frequency column, 12 plus 10 plus 7 plus 3, I get 32. So remember, this symbol means sum. Sum of the frequency columns is 32. So what I've actually found here is the sum of the scores is 1225. That's my estimate. There are 32 scores. So I'm going to estimate the mean as the sum of all the scores divided by how many there are. So to two decimal places, that comes to 38.28. So this is just an estimate of the mean. I can't know the actual mean of this data without knowing each individual score, but this will do as an estimate of the mean. So I know it takes a long time, but to estimate the median, I'm going to add yet another column for cumulative frequency. 
So the cumulative frequency column will tell me how many scores are at or below a certain point. So the first number in the cumulative frequency is just 12. So it tells me there are 12 scores in this group or below it. The next score that goes here is 12 plus 10, which is 22. So that's telling me there are 22 scores in this group or below. Basically, there are 22 scores below 50. Then we go 22 plus 7 gives me 29, and that tells us 29 scores below 75. Then I go 29 plus 3 gives me 32. There are 32 scores less than 100. So this will help us find the median. So when you're finding the median, a convenient way to find out which score is the middle is the formula n plus 1 on 2. n plus 1 on 2 doesn't tell you the median, it tells you which score is the middle. So in our data up here, n, which is the number of scores, is 32. So if I use this formula, 32 plus 1 on 2, I get 16.5. Now, the median is clearly not 16.5. 16.5 is up here. That's not the middle of the group. What it tells me, though, is the median is the 16.5th score. So that's probably a bit confusing. 16.5 is obviously halfway between 16 and 17. What this is telling me is the median is halfway between the 16th score and the 17th score. Now, the cumulative frequency column helps us locate this score. It tells us that the first 12 scores are in this group, but the next 10 scores are in this group. There, so this means the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th, all the way up to 22nd scores are all in this group. That means the 16th score and the 17th score are both in this group. So, because the middle score is in this group, I estimate the median as the midpoint of the group. So, my estimate for the median is 37.5. So once again, this isn't entirely accurate. I can't fully know the median of all this score without knowing each individual score. This is just an estimate. So the last thing I just want to say is just a note on skewness. So if we look at this data, we can see that there are more scores to the lower end. If I were to put this in a histogram, the first group has a lot of scores, second group has a few less, the third group has a few less, and so on. This is what the histogram would look like. So we say this kind of distribution of data is positively skewed. It's a bit counterintuitive. People would think positive would mean that there are more high scores. Positively skewed means there are more low scores. It means the higher frequency scores occurred closer to the minimum. Scores are clustered around the minimum. And as you go on, as the scores increase, the frequency decreases. Of course, negative skew would be the opposite. We'd have more Higher scores, scores clustered to the maximum, and the other option is symmetrical, scores would be clustered in the middle. So make sure you know the difference between positive and negative skew as well as symmetrical. This data shows data that's positively skewed because scores are clustered to the minimum. All right, let's now move on to probability. So you would know by now that in probability, we just take a random event and we assign it a number. That number has to be between 0 and 1, and it indicates how likely the event is to occur. For example, if we give a random event the number 0 0.8, that indicates it has an 80% chance of happening or it's very likely to occur. So we're going to look at first at Venn diagrams, which are a useful tool in helping us calculate probabilities. So in this question, we have 32 students, 18 have blue eyes, 5 have blonde hair, 13 have neither, and we're going to calculate each of these probabilities. I'll tell you what they mean in a second. But firstly, I want you to be able to recognize that this is a Venn diagram question because it speaks of two sets. We have first set, people with blue eyes, which I'm going to call set A, second set people with blonde hair, which I'm going to call set B. 
So when we have a probability question involving two sets, Venn diagrams just help us organize our information. So let's draw one. Venn diagrams always have a rectangle with two circles inside. So these two circles represent our two sets. So I'm going to call one of them set A. That's the set of people with blue eyes. The other set B people with blonde hair. So what we need to do is put all of these numbers, all of this information into the Venn diagram, and that will make each of these calculations much easier. So you might be thinking to yourself, wait, 18 plus 5 plus 13 equals 36, but there were only 32 students. Well, that actually can work. So if we have 18, 5, and 13, we have 36, that means we've overcounted by four. That means the only way this could possibly work is if I counted four students in the blue eyes and then again in the blonde hair category. I've overcounted by four. However many you've overcounted goes in the middle. The only way this works is if four people have both blue eyes and blonde hair. So both goes in the middle. Okay, so we need 18 people in our blue eye circle. We already have four in that circle, so there must be 14 over here. There are now 18 people with blue eyes. Similarly, we need five people with blonde hair. So we need five people in this circle. We already have four, so we need one more. The 13 that have neither go on the outside. And note, 14 plus 4 plus 1 plus 13 does equal 32. So I know I've done something right. Okay, let's go through what each of these means. So this symbol here, hopefully you remember, means and. You read this as A and B. So hopefully you remember the little U symbol means or. So this P means probability. So what this is saying is calculate the probability of A and B. In other words, calculate the probability someone has blue eyes and blonde hair. Well, there are four people with blue eyes and blonde hair out of 32 in total. So that's our probability. 4 over 32 or 1 over 8. So this one says, calculate the probability someone has blue eyes or blonde hair. So that's all of the numbers in the circle. We include all of these people because they have either blue eyes or blonde hair. 14 plus 4 plus 1 gives us 19 out of 32 in total. So make sure whenever you're asked a probability, you need to give a number between 0 and 1. It doesn't matter whether it's a fraction or a decimal, but it must be a number between 0 and 1. What a lot of people would do in this question, they just write 19, not 19 over 32. You can't have a probability of 19, so make sure probability always between 0 and 1. So this next question asks us to calculate the probability of A or not B. That means the probability they have blue eyes or not blonde hair. Now, this is a tricky one. We're going to go through each of these four numbers and see which of these applies to this set here. So A or not B. So we include these people here because we want blue eyes or not blonde hair. We include these people because they have blue eyes. We include these people because they have blue eyes. We include these people because they do not have blonde hair. We want all the people that have blue eyes, do not have blonde hair, or both. But we don't include this one person because they're not in the A circle and they're not in the not B circle. They don't have blue eyes and they don't have hair color other than blonde. So we include these people here. There's 31 of them out of 32. All right, for these last two questions, they're actually conditional probability. This symbol in the middle means given. So this one here is saying, what's the probability of A given B? It's saying, what's the probability A happens given that I know that B happens? So Relating to our question up here, this is saying, what's the prob probability someone has blue eyes given that they have blonde hair? I know they have blonde hair. What's the probability they also have blue eyes? So we're saying we know we're in the 
the blonde hair circle. We know that B has happened. What's the probability we're also in the A circle? Well, if we're in the, the blonde hair circle, there are five possibilities, and four of those possibilities also have blue eyes. Four are in the A circle, so it's four over five. So for B given A, it's just the opposite. We're saying we know we're in the A circle. What's the probability we're also in the B circle? So if we're in the A circle, there are 18 choices. And of these 18, four of them have blonde hair. Four of them are in the B circle. So it would just be 4 over 18 or 2 over 9. All right, let's now go and look at independent events. So independent events also make probability calculations a bit simpler. So I've put the definition of mutually exclusive up here, which is something entirely different. The reason I put it there is people always get mixed up between mutually exclusive and independent. So mutually exclusive events cannot both happen at the same time. For example, you can't get an A in maths this semester and also a B in maths this semester. They can't both happen. But independence is something entirely different. Two events A and B are independent if the outcome of one does not affect the outcome of another. So for example, let's say you toss a coin and roll a die. What happens on the coin, whether you get heads or tails, doesn't affect what you get on the die. That's what independent means. Now they make probability calculations easier because if two events are independent, then the probability they both happen, probability A and B, you find that by just multiplying the respective probabilities. So let's look at an example where I could apply this. So let's say I toss a coin eight times. What's the probability I get at least one head? So if I toss a coin eight times, each of these coin tosses is independent. It doesn't matter what you got on the previous coin toss. Each time you toss a coin, you have half a chance of getting heads, half probability of getting tails. So let's figure out the probability I get at least one head. Now, this could be a really long question. We'd have to figure out the probability we get one head, the probability we get two heads, probability three heads, four heads, five heads, six heads, seven heads, eight heads. That would take forever. Instead, we're going to use complementary events. So it's just commonsensical. You know, if the probability an event happens is 0.3, the probability it doesn't happen is 0.7. You just subtract the probability an event happens from 1 to get the probability it doesn't happen. So how does that possibly apply to our question here. Well, instead of figuring out the probability I get one head, two head, three heads, all the way up to eight heads, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the probability that I get zero heads, and I'm going to subtract that from one. Because not getting zero heads is the same as getting at least one head. This event not happening is the same as this event happening. So what would be the probability I get no heads? Heads. Well, that would be the probability I get all tails. If I toss a coin eight times, what is the probability that I get all tails? Well, the probability I get tails on the first toss is one half. On the second toss is one half. The probability I get tails on the third toss is one half and so on. So each of these is the probability I get a tail on that toss of the coin. Now, because each coin toss is independent, the probability each of this happens, the probability this and this and this and this all happen, I just multiply together their probabilities, and that will make it a lot easier. So I don't want to put all this in my calculator. That'll take too long. A quicker way to do it is 1 minus a half to the power of 8. So a half to the power of eight, that is the probability I get all tails. I get a tail on every one of the eight coin tosses. So the probability I don't get tails on every coin toss, i.e. the probability I get at least one head, is one minus that. So putting that on our calculator, we just get 511 over 512. Easy as. All right, let's look at how I could use independent events in tree diagrams. 
So let's say we have Queensland and New South Wales playing their three-match State of Origin series. Probability Queensland wins any given match is 0.52. We're going to find the probability that they win at least two out of three matches. So this could be a complicated question because there are heaps of ways Queensland could win at least two matches. They could win all three. They could win the first two and lose the third. They could lose the first one and win the second one. It's hard to keep track. Tree diagrams, they help us keep track of all the possible outcomes. So what we do is arrange it in columns. So for the first match, I could have Queensland or New South Wales win. Then for the second match, I could have Queensland or New South Wales win, Queensland or New South Wales win, and so on. So I follow the branches in order to list all of the outcomes. So the first outcome, I could have Q, Q, Q. That's the event that Queensland wins all three matches. So then the second one, Queensland, Queensland, New South Wales. That's the event that Queensland wins the first two, and then New South Wales wins the third, and so on for the other six outcomes. So these are the eight possible outcomes. That's what the tree diagram was for. So you, you might be tempting for you to say, okay, each of these has probability 1, 8, but they are not equally likely. The reason is each time Queensland has a slightly higher chance of winning, 0 0.52. So each time I have a Queensland, I need to write 0 0.52 because that's their chance of winning, and that means New South Wales have a 0 0.48 chance of winning. So each... And I need to write 0 0.48. So now I'm going to identify which outcomes I'm interested in. I want just the ones where Queensland win two out of the three matches. So this one, and this one, and this one. They're all Queensland winning at least two. And this one is Queensland winning at least two. So what does this have to do with independent events? Well, each of these outcomes, can their probabilities can be calculated simply from independent events. I can calculate the probability of this by just multiplying each of these numbers together. So the probability Queensland win all three matches is 0 0.52 times 0 0.52 times 0 0.52, which is 0 0.140608. So I can find this probability by just going 0.52 times 0.52 times 0.48. So then I get 0.129792. Now note this one will have the same probability as this one because I'm multiplying the same numbers together, two 0.52s and a 0.48. So to find the probability that Queensland wins three matches in a row or the first two or the first and the third or the last two, all I need to do is add up all of these numbers. So adding up these four numbers, that gives me about 0 0.53. That's to two decimal places. So that's my final answer. The probability they win at least two out of three matches is 0 0.53. And this was made a lot easier by independent events. So the reason each match is independent is just because of the information I gave. I said the probability Queensland wins any given match is 0.52. So that means it doesn't matter what happened in the previous match, each match, Queensland has a 52% chance of winning. All right, that's all for probability. Let's move on to index laws. So here we have the first six index laws. So let's go through what they're saying. The first one says if you multiply bases, so A is the base, you add the powers. B and C are the powers. So if you add something like x to the power of 3 times x to the power of 5, what you do here is you keep the same base, base is x, and you add the powers. So if you have numbers as well as bases, then do them separately. So if I have something like 2x to the power of 4 times 3x, I do the numbers separately. 2 times 3 is 6. Now x to the power of 4 times x, I keep the same base, but I add the powers. So x is the same as x to the power of 1. So the answer would be 6x to the power of 5. And then we're done. All right, the second index law says if you're dividing bases, you keep the same base and subtract the powers. So if I had something like x to the power of 20, divide x to the power of 5, 
I keep the same base and subtract the powers. So the third index law says if you raise a power to another power, keep the same base, but this time multiply the power. So if I have something like x to the power of 2 to the power of 9, I keep the same base and I multiply the powers 2 times 9 gives me 18. The fourth index law says anything not 0 to the power of 0 equals 1. So 1 to the power of 0 is 1, 2 to the power of 0 is 1, minus 3 to the power of 0 is equal to 1. If I have something like 4x to the power of 0, so in this one, order of operations mean only the x is raised to the power of 0. So this thing I've circled is equal to 1, so the whole thing is equal to 4 times 1, which is equal to 4. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. Now, if I had the 4x in brackets to the power of 0, now I'm raising the whole thing to the power of 0. That would just be 1. So make sure you know the difference between these two. Because of order operations, here everything is getting raised to the power of 0. Here only the x is raised to the power of 0. All right, so... Index law 5 says if you have a product, A times B, two things being multiplied together, if you have a product to a power, just raise the first thing to the power and the second thing to the power. Please note the difference between 5 and 3. Here B is a power, here B is a base. Here B is being times, here we're raising A to the power of B. So let's say I have something like 3x in brackets, to the power of 4. So people always remember to raise the x to the power of 4, but they often forget this law says you also have to raise the 3 to the power of 4. So 3 to the power of 4, you can use your calculator, is just 81. So that's our final answer here. You have to raise the 3 to the power of 4 and the x to the power of 4. All right, this last index law says if you have a fraction to a power, just raise the top thing to that power and the bottom thing to that power. Now, sometimes you'll have to use multiple index laws. So let's look at this question. So if I wanted to do this, I need to use multiple index laws. So what I have to do, what index law 6 is saying, is to do this, I need to raise the top thing to the power of 3 and the bottom thing to the power of 3. So let's just start by raising this to the power of 3. Well, I actually need to use this product rule, index law 5. So I raise 2 to the power of 3, and I need to raise x cubed to the power of 3. To do x cubed to the power of 3, I need index law 3. x cubed to the power of 3, I'm going to keep the same base and multiply the powers. So index law 6 says we've raised the top to the power. Now we need to raise the bottom to the power. So I go 5 to the power of 3 and then y to the power of 7 to the power of 3. So I'm going to keep the same base and multiply the powers. Then I'm done. Let's now look at negative indices. So the rule for negative indices is here. a to the power of negative b equals 1 over a to the power of b. So what we do if we have a negative power, we move it to the bottom of the fraction but write it with a positive power. So if I have 3x to the power of negative 3, note here only x is being raised to a negative power. So the 3 goes on top. The x to the power of negative 3, I move it to the bottom of the fraction, but write it with a positive power, and then I'm done. All right, let's take this expression now and write it with only positive powers. So anything with a positive power goes on top, so 4 and z cubed goes on top. Anything with a negative power goes to the bottom, but you change its power to positive. So then we're done. These two are the same expression, but this has only positive powers. All right, let's look at this one now. To do this, I'm going to need to use some of the index laws on the previous slide. So because I have a product here, I'm going to raise this to the power of negative 4, this to the power of negative 4, this to the power of negative 4. So negative 2 to the power of negative 4. You can use your calculator, but make sure you use brackets. Whenever you substitute a negative, you need to use brackets or you'll get the wrong answer. So I'm going to raise that to the power of negative 4. I'm going to raise x cubed to the power of negative 4. And I'm going to raise y to the power of negative 2 to the power of negative 4. 
So if I put this on my calculator and use brackets like I should, I should get 1 over 16. So x cubed to the power of negative 4. So I'm going to keep the same base and multiply the power. So 3 times 4 is negative 12. And then this one here, I go y minus 2 times minus 4 actually gives me positive 8. So to write this expression using only positive powers, see the x has a negative power. It goes to the bottom of the fraction, but I write it with a positive power. The y to the power of 8, it has a positive power, so it goes on top. So I'm just going to write y to the power of 8. I don't need to write 1 anymore. So this is my final answer. So when you have a fraction to a negative power, to make life easy for yourself, all you do is flip the fraction and change the power to positive. Okay, so now to finish this off, I'm just going to use index law 6 from the previous slide. I'm going to raise the top to the power of 2, so I'd get 16y to the power of 4, and I'm going to raise the bottom to that power, 3 to the power of 2, x to the power of 2. And then I'm done. I can't simplify this any further. Some people think because 4 and 2 have a common factor, I can cross them out. I can't do that here because they're powers. So I can't simplify this any further. I'm done. Let's move on to certs next. So a third is just the square root of a non-perfect square. And that always gives you an irrational number. So just so you know, perfect squares are these numbers here. 1 times 1, 1 squared is 1, that's a perfect square. 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared. The next one would be 49, which is 7 times 7. They are perfect squares. So if you square root a number that's not a perfect square, it's a third, it's an irrational number. That means its decimal goes on forever, but there is no pattern. So we need to be able to perform operations with certs. So it's pretty easy for multiplying and dividing. To multiply two thirds together, you just multiply the things under the square root. To divide two thirds, you just divide the two things under the square root. So for example, if I had the square root of five times the square root of 10, that would just be the square root of 5 times 10, which is 50. All of these are thirds because 5 is not a perfect square. It wasn't our list. 10 is not a perfect square. 50 is not a perfect square. So all of these are irrational numbers. So let's say I had something like the square root of 84 divided by the square root of 21. So again, these are irrational numbers because 84 is not a perfect square, nor is 21. So to write this as a single third, it's just the square root. Now, 84 divided 21 just gives you 4. But hang on a minute, 4 is a perfect square. The square root of 4 is not irrational, it's just 2. Because 2 times 2 is 4. So this is a rational number, even though both of those were irrational. So to simplify a third, we don't change its value, but we write it with a smaller number under the square root sign. So sometimes we'll get a number like the square root of 48, and we will want to simplify it. That means we don't want to change its value. We just want to write it with a smaller number under the square root. It's kind of like simplifying fractions. You don't change the value of a fraction. You just write it with smaller numbers. Like, you know, 4 over 8 equals a half. You haven't changed the value. Just wrote it with smaller numbers. So how we do that, we need to find a square number, a perfect square number that goes into 48. 4 goes into 48 but we really want the highest perfect square that goes into it. So the highest perfect square that goes into it is 16. So because of our rule up here, we can write square root of 48 as root 16 times root 3, because 16 times 3 is 48. I chose 16 because it's the highest perfect square that goes into 48. The square root of 16 is just 4. So I can write this as 4 root 3. These two things equal the same number, probably about 7.95 or something like that. They both equal the same thing, but this is said to be simpler because it's got smaller number under the square root. So what about the square root of 75? 
So to simplify that, I need the highest square number, highest perfect square, that goes into 75, and that's 25. So I can write this as the square root of 25 times the square root of 3, because 25 times 3 is 75. The square root of 25 is just 5, so I just leave this as 5 root 3. So if I wanted to add together square root of 48 and square root of 75, adding thirds is a little more difficult because you can only add like thirds. You can only add thirds that have the same number under the square root. It's kind of like in algebra how you can only add or subtract like terms. But if I simplify these two, it makes it easier. So I found that 48 were, square root of 48 was 4 root 3. I found the square root of 75 was 5 root 3. So if I add them together, I get 9 root 3. If you have 4 root 3s and you add 5 root 3s, you get 9 root 3s. This is just like if I had 4x plus 5x, I get 9x. All right, we're done with indices and thirds. Let's move on to measurement. So we're going to start with converting units, which seems to have caused so much problems. So you have to remember, when you're converting square or cube units, you must square or cube the conversion factor. So these are the conversion factors here. The conversion factor for millimetres and centimetres is 10, because there are 10 millimetres in a centimetre. The conversion factor when going between centimetres and metres is 100, because there are 100 centimetres in a metre, and so on. So just make sure you understand that to go from a smaller unit to a larger unit, you divide. So smaller to larger, you divide. That's because there are fewer of the larger unit. If you want to go from a larger to a smaller unit, you multiply. So like going kilometers to meters, we multiply because there are more of the smaller unit. There are more meters than kilometers. So that's all well and good for converting millimeters, centimeters, meters, kilometers. What about square units? Well, let's look at this square heat here. This is a one meter by one meter square. So its area is one meter squared. Nothing crazy about that. But one meter is a hundred centimeters. So the area of this square is a hundred centimeters by a hundred centimeters. So the area of this square in centimeter squared is a hundred by a hundred, which is actually 10,000. So there are a hundred centimeters in a meter, but there are 10,000 square centimeters in a meter squared. And that's because we have to square the conversion factor. So if I'm going from millimeter squared, centimeter squared, and all that, all of these conversion factors need to be squared. So if I'm going from centimetre squared to metre squared, I need to divide by not 100, but 100 squared. So if I want to go metre squared to centimetre squared, 3 metre squared, I just take my 3 and times by 100 squared. And you can put that on your calculator. 3 times 100 squared gives you 30,000. So if I want to go from millimetres cubed to centimetres cubed, I would need to cube this. So to go from millimetres to centimetres, remember I'm dividing because I'm going from a smaller to a larger unit. But I wouldn't divide by 10 squared, I'd divide by 10 cubed because these are cubic units. That's what I mean, cubing the conversion factor. So to go millimetres cubed to centimetres cubed, I'm going to divide by 10 cubed. So in my calculator, I go 4280 divide 10 cubed or divide 1000. And 4280 divided by 1000, of course, just gives you 4.28. So one thing that's not on the chart up here is hectares. Hectares is already a square unit. One hectare is 10,000 meters squared. So if I want to go from hectares to kilometres, what I need to do is convert 10,000 metres squared into kilometres squared. Well, the chart here says to go from metres squared to kilometres squared, you divide by 1,000 squared. So if I want to convert this into kilometres squared, I go 10,000 divided by 1,000 squared. You actually get 0.01 which is the same as one hundredth. One hectare is one hundredth 
of a kilometer squared. There are 100 hectares in a kilometer squared. So if I have 300 hectares and I want to go to a kilometer squared, well, hopefully you see from here, a hectare is much smaller than a kilometer squared. So to perform this conversion here, I'm going from a smaller unit to a larger unit, and smaller to larger means divide. So 300 hectares to kilometer squared, I divide by 100 and just get 3, because 1 hectare is 100th of a kilometer squared, 1 kilometer squared is equal to 100 hectares. So please make sure you look over this, this has caused so much trouble. Let's now go through area. So we're just going to calculate the area of these shapes here. It's a matter of knowing the formula. So the first shape here is a trapezium. I've chosen this because it causes a lot of problems. A trapezium is a four-sided shape with one pair of parallel sides. To find its area, you go H. H always stands for perpendicular height divided by 2 times A plus B. A and B are the two parallel sides. So the area of this shape is perpendicular height divided by 2 multiplied by the sum of the two parallel sides. So if we put that in calculator, we get 70. Now, please remember to write units. People throw away marks by not writing units. Because all this was in meters, areas in square units, it would be 70 meters squared. All right, this next shape here is a sector, which is part of a circle. So the area of a circle you should know is pi r squared. So when we have a sector, we just times that by theta over 360. Theta is the angle in the middle of the sector. The reason is theta over 360 tells us what fraction of the circle we have. 40 over 360 is 1 over 9. This is one ninth of a circle. So we find the area of the full circle and times it by one ninth. Take one ninth of it. So for this one, the area is going to be theta over 360 times pi times radius squared and just put that straight in your calculator. So to two decimal places, I get about 22.34, and again, it's square units, centimeters squared. All right, let's look at this shape here. Now, this shape doesn't have a name. It's a weird-looking shape. It's actually a composite shape. To find the area shaded here, I need to divide this into shapes I know. So what I have is a square plus a semicircle with a triangle cut out of it. So to find the area, I'm going to find the area of the square. So that's just going to be 12 squared. Now I'm going to find the area of a semicircle. So the area of any circle is pi times radius squared. So here the diameter is 12, so the radius will be half that, which is 6. So pi times 6 squared would be a full circle, but because it's half a circle, I need to divide by 2. So that gives us the area of the whole thing here, but we need to subtract the area of this triangle here, which is not easy. So this triangle here is an equilateral triangle with side length 4. In order to find its area, I need to find its perpendicular height. So sometimes you will have to use Pythagoras to find unknown sides. So let's call H its perpendicular height. What I have here is a small right-angled triangle. This side would be 2, half of 4, and 4 would be the hypotenuse. So h would be the square root of 4 squared minus 2 squared. You always subtract when you're using Pythagoras to find a shorter side. So putting that in our calculator, we get the square root of 12, or about 3.464. That is the perpendicular height of this triangle. We need that to find the area because the formula for the area of a triangle is base times perpendicular height. So base times perpendicular height divided by 2. So here I added this shape here but subtracted the triangle because it was cut out. So I'm just going to put all of this straight on my calculator. 
And so the answer I get to two decimal places is about 193.62. And of course, it's in square units here, meters squared. All right, let's now move on to surface area and volume. So area is what I calculate for two-dimensional shapes, but surface area, volume, and also capacity is for 3D shapes. So we looked mostly at prisms. A cylinder is for all intents and purposes a prism. So let's calculate the surface area and volume of this shape here. So to calculate the surface area of any prism, all you do is add up the area of each of its faces. So for a cylinder, it's a bit complicated. It's a rectangle plus two circles. You just have to remember this formula. 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. r is the radius. h is always the perpendicular height. So the total surface area of this cylinder here is 2 pi r. So the diameter is 12. The radius will be 6. 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h and you can put this straight in your calculator so we get approximately so the two decimal places 1055.558 sorry and of course surface area is in square units so that's the surface area so the volume of any shape we go through is the area of the base times the height. So for a cylinder, the area of the base, the base is a circle, is just pi r squared. And I'm going to times that by the perpendicular height. So for here, I have the volume is equal to pi times radius squared. So pi times 6 squared is the area of this circle here, the area of the base, and then I just times that by the perpendicular height. So this time I'll give it to three decimal places. Putting that straight on a calculator, we get 2488.141 so this time it's cubic units. Volume is in cubic units. So that's the volume, 2488.141 meters cubed. So if I want to know the capacity of this shape, it's actually a very easy calculation. You see, the only difference between volume and capacity is units. Volume is measured in cubic units, like centimeters cubed or meters cubed. Capacity is measured in units we associate with liquids, milliliters, liters, kilo liters and things like that so you only need to know these two conversions to go from volume to capacity so one meter cubed is a thousand liters so if this is the volume in meters cubed all i do is times it by a thousand and that's its capacity in liters so it'd be two four eight eight one four one liters so this cylinder would hold 2,488,141 litres, okay? And that's to be expected because this it would be a huge cylinder. It would be like bigger than a lot of houses. So that's why it would hold so many litres. All right, let's look at this shape here. So let's calculate its surface area and volume. So this is a triangular prism. So to find its surface area... I need to find the area of each of its faces. So this has two triangular faces and three rectangular faces. So we have the triangle at the front and the back. We have this rectangle at the back, this rectangle at the bottom. And we have this rectangle at the top. Sometimes people forget to include this one. So to find this rectangle at the top, though, I need to know this length here. So again, I'll use Pythagoras. So to use Pythagoras, this would just be the square root of 6 squared plus 8 squared. The reason I'm adding this time is I'm finding the longest side. When you're finding the hypotenuse using Pythagoras, you add. When you're finding a shorter side using Pythagoras, you subtract. So putting that straight in my calculator, I get 10 meters. That is the length of this side here. So to find the total surface area... I'm going to take the two triangles. So the area of this triangle is base times perpendicular height over 2. But I'm going to times it by 2 because there are actually two of those triangles. Now the three rectangles. So the one on the bottom is 8 by 15. 
The one at the back is 6 by 15, so that's two of the rectangles, and the third rectangle at the top is 10 by 15. So I can just put this straight on my calculator again. So putting that on my calculator, I get 408. So remember, this is in square units, so it'll be 408 meters squared. So we don't have a formula for the surface area of a triangular prism because unfortunately it would need to be a different formula depending on what type of triangle we had. So just go through and add up the area of each of its faces. So let's now calculate the volume of this shape. So the volume of a prism is the area of the base times the height. Well, I figured out the area of the base, the area of the triangle already. It was 6 times 8 over 2. It was just 24. So this time I'm not going to times this by 2 because the formula doesn't say add up the two triangles. The formula says take the area of the base, which is this, and times by the height of the prism. So when we say height of the prism H, we mean perpendicular height. We mean the dimension that's perpendicular to the base. So this 15 meter side is perpendicular to the base, the base being the triangle. So all you do is multiply these two together. So putting that in our calculator, we get 360 meters cubed. Again, volume is in cubic units. So the capacity of this shape, I would just times meters cubed by a thousand. It would hold 360,000 liters. All right, the last thing we need to do in measurement is finding an unknown dimension. So sometimes you'll be given the surface area, volume, or area of a shape, and you'll need to find a dimension, by which I mean a side length, diameter, length, width, whatever. So let's do this one first. So a cylindrical can holds one liter of liquid, height 25 centimeters, what's the diameter? So whenever you are asked to find a dimension, given the area, surface area, or volume, start by writing the formula. So which formula would we use? Well, this is a cylinder, and since we're talking about one liter capacity, we're gonna use the volume formula. The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared, which is the area of the base, times the height. So after you write the formula, we're gonna substitute in everything we're told. So we're told that the height is 25 centimeters. So I'm just gonna change h to 25. Now we're told the volume is one liter, but I want these units to be consistent. Since this is centimeters, I need the volume in centimeters cubed. So hopefully you know one liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. But remember on the previous slide, I had the conversion one milliliter equals a centimeter cubed. One mil is exactly the same as one centimeter cubed. They're literally the same thing. So a thousand mils is a thousand centimeters cubed. One liter is a thousand centimeters cubed. So I'm gonna change V, not so it's one, but so it's a thousand. See, by doing that, now everything's in the same units. Now the volume is in the same units as the height, both in centimeters. So now I've got an equation, I'm just gonna rearrange to find what I don't know. So this asks for the diameter, but it, I am just gonna rearrange and find the radius, and then I can just double it to find the diameter. So I go 1,000 divided by 25, that gives me 40 equals pi r squared. To solve this equation, I need to undo what's been done to R. So I'm going to do things in the opposite order to bid mass. When we're looking at bid mass, raising to a power comes before multiplication. So when I'm solving this equation, I do it in the opposite order. What I need to do is do the division first. I need to undo multiplication and then undo squaring. So square rooting each side is the last thing I do. R will be the square root of 40 over pi. It's really important you get the order of operations correct, otherwise you will get the wrong answer. So I undo squaring by square rooting, and that's the last thing I undo. I undid everything else before I undid the squaring. 
So putting this in my calculator, I get R is approximately 3.57. So it would be in centimeters, since that's what the question was in, everything was in centimeters. So that means the diameter would just be double that. So it would be about 7.14 centimeters, and then we're done. All right, let's look at this question here. So this time we're given information about the area and we have to find an unknown side. So I'm going to start like I did the last one by writing the formula. So this time we're using area and we're using area of a trapezium since the shape given is a trapezium. So I'm going to rub out H and replace it with 6 because the perpendicular height is 6. I'm going to rub out A because I'm told the area is 72. Okay, that was big A for area. So then I've got A and B are the two parallel sides. It doesn't matter which parallel side is A and which parallel side is B. So I'm just going to rub out little A and I'm going to replace it with 14. And then the other parallel side I'm going to replace with X. So this is sort of the hard part getting to the equation. Because if you can get from there to this equation, it's easy. You've solved equations like this heaps of time. Of course, 6 over 2 is just 3. So I just might write 3 just to make it a little easier for myself. So what I do now is undo everything that's been done to x. So again, I need to undo things in the opposite order to bid mass. So here I added first and then multiplied by 3 because of the brackets. So this is the first thing I undo. I'm going to undo multiplying by 3 by dividing each side by 3. So I get 24 equals 14 plus x. And then I simply subtract 14 from both sides to get x. So x is therefore 10 meters. If x was 10 meters and you use the area formula for a trapezium, you get 72 meters squared and then we're done. All right, that's all for measurement. Let's move on now to similar figures, including similar triangles. So two shapes are said to be similar if both of these statements are true. Pairs of corresponding angles need to be equal and pairs of corresponding sides in proportion. Two shapes have to have both of those to be similar. It's possible they have one but not the other. So for example, let's look at these two shapes here, a parallelogram and a rectangle. The sides are in proportion because 6 divided 3 and 4 divided by 2 both equal 2. There's a consistent scale factor. This side is double that side, this side's double that side. That's what I mean by sides being in proportion. But you can see clearly these two do not have equal angles. The rectangle has all right angles, but this shape here clearly doesn't have any right angles. So these two shapes are not similar, even though their sides are in proportion. Because the idea behind similarity is that they will be the same shape, but not necessarily the same size. And these aren't the same shape. This is a rectangle and a parallelogram. So that's what we mean by similarity. So normally both of these need to be true. But for triangles, instead of looking at all of the angles and seeing where they're equal, and all the pairs of sides and seeing where they're in proportion, we can use one of four tests. So these are the four tests here. So the SSS test, S stands for sides in proportion. The SSS test means you have three pairs of sides in proportion. So here, this would these two triangles satisfy the SSS test because six divided by four, six divided by four, 3 divided by 2, all equal 1.5. There is a consistent scale factor. Each side in the larger shape is 1.5 times its corresponding side in the smaller shape. That's the SSS test. Three pairs of sides in proportion. For the SAS test, it must be two pairs of sides in proportion, but it has to be the angle between them that's equal. So in this diagram here, those two angles, this one and this one, they would be equal because they are vertically opposite. So 18 divided by 9 and 14 divided by 7 both equal 2. This side and this side are in the same proportion as these two sides. So we have two pairs of sides, one, two pairs of sides in proportion, and the angle between them is equal. That's the SAS test. The third test is the RHS test. So for that, it only works in right angles. So what you need is a right angle in both triangles. 
then the hypotenuses have to be in the same proportion as another side. So here, 9 over 3 and 6 over 2 both equal 3. This side is 3 times this side. This side's three times this side. So these two pairs of sides are in proportion, and there's the right angle too. So we have right angle, hypotenuse, and another side. They satisfy the RHS test. So if you have no information about sides, which is what we have in this diagram here, the only option to you is the final test, AAA. Two triangles will actually be similar if they have three pairs of equal angles. So triangles are different to other shapes. For quadrilaterals, they could have all angles equal, yet not be similar. They could have all sides in proportion, yet not be similar. But that can't work for triangle. If a triangle has all sides in proportion, then all of its angles will be equal. On the other hand, it turns out that if two triangles have pairs of corresponding angles equal, if they have the same angles, then their sides must be in proportion. So for these two triangles here, they have a common angle here. That's in both triangles, so it must be equal in both triangles. Now also, because of the parallel lines, these two angles are corresponding. Corresponding angles over parallel lines are equal. So we have one two pairs of equal angles. It turns out if you have two pairs of equal angles, that's enough. The third pair must also be equal because the angles in any triangle add up to 180. So this triangle, this smaller triangle, and this larger triangle, they are similar by the AAS test. All right, let's now look at using similarity to find unknown sides. So, to use similarity to find unknown sides, we just look at their scale factors. So you just multiply by the scale factor to find an unknown side in the larger shape, divide by the scale factor to find a side in the smaller shape. Now, I want you to always use the scale factor as the side in the larger shape divided by the corresponding side in the smaller shape. That will mean that this rule in red always works. So when you're doing the scale factor, you should always get a number greater than or equal to 1. So let's look at these two triangles here. Now they are similar by the AAS test. They have 1, 2 pairs of equal angles. Remember, if they have 2 pairs of equal angles, the third pair of angles must also be equal. So these two triangles are similar by the AAS test, meaning that sides will be in proportion. So now what we'll do is we will find the scale factor. So we need to find two pairs of corresponding sides. Now it can be a bit tricky to find which side here matches up or corresponds with which side here. Because we might not be sure has it been rotated, reflected, whatever. So what we do is we look at the angles. See how this 8 shape here is touching the arc and the dot. It corresponds to the side in this shape here that is touching the arc and the dot. 8 and 12 are corresponding sides. So that means that the scale factor is the side in the larger shape divided by corresponding side in the smaller shape. The scale factor is 1.5. What that means is each side in this larger shape is one and a half times its corresponding side in the smaller shape. And we're going to use that to find X and Y. So to find X, note X is in the larger shape. So we're finding a side in the larger shape. So finding a side in the larger shape, you multiply. So what I do is I find the side corresponding to X. So X is touching the dot and the cross. So it corresponds to the one touching the dot and the cross. It corresponds to the 10. So X, I take its corresponding side. I times by the scale factor because it's in the larger shape. So it's just 10 times 1.5, which is 15. So to find Y, Y is actually in the smaller shape. So it corresponds to the side that's 9. This time I'm going to divide by the scale factor because I'm finding a side in the smaller shape. So 9 divided by 1.5 is 6. So x is 15, y is 6. We're done.
So this can also be used to solve problems. Similar triangles are very handy in solving real-world problems. So one famous idea was to use similar triangles to find the width of an inaccessible object. So what we can do is use this to find, say, the width of a river. So if this is the river and you have the bank over here, you just put rocks at all of these locations, measure the distance between them, and just make sure they're right angles. We can actually use that to find the width of a river. So we have one smaller triangle, one larger triangle. If this angle is 90 degrees, then this angle here must be 90 degrees. So both of these triangles have a 90 degree angle. They also have a common angle. So this smaller triangle and larger triangle are similar by the AAA test. They have two pairs of equal angles, which means their third pair of angles must also be equal. So because the triangles are similar, sides are in proportion. So we can see clearly this side and this side correspond. So the scale factor here is 10 over 6, which simplifies to 5 over 3. Side in larger shape divided by side in smaller shape. So we're going to use this to find the width of the river. I'm going to call this side x. So this one's a bit tricky because we don't know the side in the smaller shape and we don't know the side in the larger shape. So we're going to call the side in the smaller shape x. The side in the larger shape is x plus 4. So what the scale factor tells us is that if we multiply the side in the smaller shape by the scale factor, we should get the side in the larger shape. So 5 over 3 times x equals x plus 4. Now we need to solve that equation, which isn't easy. So when you have x on both sides of a linear equation, you subtract the x with the lowest coefficient. I'm just going to subtract x from both sides, so I get rid of it on this side of the equation because I can only solve equations when x is on one side. So 5 over 3x minus x. So that just gives me 2 thirds of x equals 4. Okay, because 5 over 3 minus 1 gives me 2 thirds. So 2 thirds of x equals 4. So x is just going to be 4 divided by 2 thirds. So if you go 4 divided by 2 thirds on your calculator, you get just 6. So it turns out the width of this river is 6 meters. All right, let's now look at area and volume scale factors. Okay, so if the scale factor of sides is k, you square that to find the area scale factor, you cube it to find the volume scale factor. So let's look at these two shapes here. So here, clearly, the scale factor, which means scale factor of sides, is 6 over 3, which is 2. So assuming these shapes are similar, each side in this shape is double the length of the sides in this shape. So the area here is 6 centimetres squared. The scale factor is 2. That means the area scale factor is 2 squared, which is 4. What that means is the area of this shape will be 4 times the area of this shape. So if you double the side lengths, you actually quadruple the area. So this shape here, its area will be 6 times 4, which is 24 centimetres squared. So the same sort of rule applies as on the previous slide. If we're finding something in the larger shape, we times by, in this case, the area scale factor. And if we're finding something in the smaller shape, as we will in the next example, you divide by the relevant scale factor. All right, that's done. So let's look at these two here. So let's say these two cylinders are similar. So we know the volume of each, and we're going to use that to find the side length. So here, I can find the volume scale factor by simply dividing one volume by the other. So if I do that, I get approximately 2.744. That's the volume scale factor. The volume of the larger shape is 2.744 times the volume of the smaller shape.
So how can I use this to find the value of x? Well, x is a side length. In order to find the side length, I need to know the scale factor, or if you like, the scale factor of sides. So this here, this volume scale factor is k cubed. It's the scale factor cubed. So k cubed is 2.744. I want to find what k is. So the way we undo cubing is cubed root. So on my calculator, I'm going to go cubed root of 2.744, and I actually get 1.4. See, what I've actually calculated is k. If the volume scale factor is 2.744, the scale factor is the cubed root of that, which is 1.4. I've just found that for this to work, the sides in this shape must be 1.4 times the sides in this shape. So now I can find x easily. So remember, x is in the smaller shape, so I'm going to take its corresponding side and divide by the scale factor, and I get 5. So because this was in metres, this will again be in metres. X is 5 metres. That's the height of the cylinder. All right, that's all for similarity. Let's move on to quadratics. So a quadratic equation is one that has an x squared term. We don't try to solve these like linear equations. Instead, what we do is factorize and use the null factor law. The null factor law says if two things, a and b, multiply to give zero, then either the first thing equals zero or the second thing equals zero. So let's use the null factor law on these two examples. These are already factorized for us. So we have something times something equals zero. The null factor law says either the first something equals zero or the second something equals zero. If the first bracket equals zero, x equals minus three. Minus three is the value that makes the first bracket equal zero because minus three plus three is zero. Now, if the second bracket equals zero, then x would be one because one minus one equals zero. So there are actually two solutions to this equation. That happens all the time with quadratics. There's sometimes one solution, but usually there are two solutions to quadratics. So these are the solutions and we're done. So let's look at this one here. We're again going to use the null factor law. We have something times something equals zero. Either the first thing equals zero or the second thing equals zero. So if 2x minus 5 equals zero, we can just add 5 to both sides and then divide each side by 2. So again, there are two solutions. x equals zero makes this a true statement. x equals 2.5 makes this a true statement. So that's all well and good when the factorizing is already done for you. But what about when you need to factorize? So the way we factorize quadratics is different depending on whether it's a binomial or a trinomial. A binomial is a quadratic with two terms. This is a binomial because there are one, two terms, and one of them is an x squared term. This is a binomial. There's an x squared term, which makes it a quadratic, and it's a binomial because there are two terms. When you're factorizing binomials, we have two methods, highest common factor or difference of two squares. Sometimes you need both. So let's look at highest common factor. So that's when both of the terms, remember there's only two terms, both terms have a common factor. So here, x squared is one term, 3x is another term. They both have a common factor of x. So what I do is I write the common factor out the front. So now I say, what do I times by x to get x squared? Well, that's just x. What do I times by x to get 3x? Well, that's just positive 3. So now you can see that I factorized it. This looks like the ones up here. I can just use the null factor law. Either the first thing is equal to 0, or the second thing is equal to 0. Now, if the second thing, if the bracket equals 0, x would be minus 3. So my two solutions here are 0 minus 3. Both of these make this a true statement. So how would I do this one here? Same idea. They both have a common factor. They both have an x, but they also have a common factor of 2. 
So I write the highest common factor out the front. So now I say, what do I times by 2x to get 6x squared? I need to times by 3 to get to 6 and x to get to x squared. What do I times by 2x to get minus 10x? And that's just minus 5. So now, this is just like these up here. I use the null factor law. Either 2x equals 0, which gives me x equals 0, or 3x minus 5 equals 0, which would mean x is equal to 5 over 3. So they are the two solutions, and we're done. So if it's not highest common factor, it would be difference of two squares. So see here, x squared minus 9 equals 0. x squared and 9 do not have a common factor. That's why I can't use the HCF method. But what I have is a perfect square minus a perfect square, hence the name difference of two squares. So this is how you do the difference of two squares. You get two brackets. You square root the first, so the square root of x squared. And then you square root the other thing, square root the 9. So 1 gets a plus and 1 gets a minus. So note, if I were to expand this using FOIL, x plus 3, x minus 3, I'd get x squared minus 9. So now we use the null factor law. Either the first bracket is equal to 0 or the second bracket equals 0. If x plus 3 equals 0, x equals minus 3. If x minus 3 equals 0, x equals plus 3. They're the two solutions. This one here is also difference of two squares, because that's a perfect square, that's a perfect square. So, square root the first, square root of 4x squared is 2x, and then I'm going to square root the second. Okay, and as I said before, 1 gets a plus, 1 gets a minus. So, using the null factor law here, either the first bracket equals 0 or the second bracket equals 0. If the first bracket equals 0, you get minus 5 over 2. If the second bracket equals 0, you get positive 5 over 2. They're the two solutions. All right, let's do this one in the middle that requires both. So... Here we have a common factor. There's not an x as a common factor, though, because x isn't here. The common factor is 2. So let's take out a common factor of 2. So we write the common factor out the front. What do I times by 2 to get 2x squared? What do I times by 2 to get negative 32? Okay, so now notice this here is the difference of two squares. So the way I factorize x squared minus 16, I'm just going to leave the 2 alone. So then I square root the first, square root the second, 1 gets a plus, and 1 gets a minus. So the 2 doesn't affect the solution at all. The null factor law says either this equals 0, which means x equals minus 4, or the second thing equals 0, which means x equals positive 4, okay? So that's all for binomials. Let's look at how we do it if it's a quadratic trinomial. So a quadratic trinomial has three terms. Notice in each of these, there are always one, two, three terms. One, two, three terms. So they're quadratics because they have an x squared term, and trinomials because they have three terms. So we need to factorize a different way. We can't use the highest common factor method on something like this because all three terms don't have a common factor. We can't use the difference of two squares because I don't have two perfect squares here. So what we use instead is the sum and product rule. What you do is you find two numbers that multiply to the constant term and add to the coefficient of x. Two numbers that multiply to this, add to this. Two numbers that multiply to this, add to this. Multiply to this, add to this. So looking at this example here, we want two numbers that multiply to 8 and add to 6. Those numbers are 4 and 2. So what we do is we set up two brackets, putting an x in each, and we put those two numbers, positive 4 and positive 2, in the brackets. So now we have factorized this, we can use the null factor law. Either the first bracket equals 0, or the second bracket equals 0. They are the two solutions, and we're done. 
So let's look at this one over here, x squared plus 6x plus 9. We want two numbers that multiply to 9 and add to 6. It turns out they're the same number. So the numbers that multiply to 9 and add to 6 are 3 and 3. So this is how we factorize. This time there's only one solution. If this bracket equals zero, then x is minus three. If this bracket equals zero, x is minus three. So this time we only have one solution. Sometimes quadratics only have one solution. Usually they have two. So let's look at this example here, a little more difficult because of the negative. This time, we want two numbers that multiply to 24, but they have to add to negative 11. So we set up our brackets. So two numbers that multiply to 24 and add to negative 11 are minus 8 and minus 3. So minus 8 and minus 3 are not the solutions to this equation. They are the numbers that go in the brackets. The solution to this equation are the opposite. The solutions are 8, positive 8, and positive 3. If x minus 8 equals 0, x equals 8. And if x minus 3 equals 0, then x equals 3. Let's do the last one here. We want two numbers that multiply to negative 14 and add to negative 5. So we'll set up our brackets. Now, because we're finding two numbers that multiply to a negative, one of the numbers must be positive and one must be negative. So just go through, if you're stuck, factors of 14. So there aren't that many. 14 and 1 wouldn't work, but 7 and 2 would. It would work if I make it a negative 7 and a positive 2, because... Negative 7 plus 2 is minus 5. Negative 7 times 2 is negative 14. So the two numbers that multiply negative 14 and add to negative 5, they were negative 7 and 2. But remember, negative 7 and 2 are not the solutions. They're the numbers that go in the brackets. The solutions are the opposite. The solutions are positive 7 and negative 2. Using the null factor law, if this equals 0, x equals 7. If this equals 0, x equals minus 2. All right, sorry for the long video, but best of luck studying for your exam. You will ace it. You're a superstar. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Have a great day.